My name is Kupa'ahi. Growing up here in Hawaii, I've been exploring our beautiful forests from a young age. I'm thankful for every day I can be out here surrounded by such beauty. Over the next hour, buckle up as we take you soaring over some of Hawaii's most spectacular landscapes. I invite you to ride along as we visit remote areas viewed by few, but vitally important to us all. Along the way, you'll meet people who've made it their life mission to protect Hawaii's forests. Folks who are doing both big and little things to preserve them and help them along. They each have amazing, inspirational stories to share. So like, you know, that looks pretty good. In my own story, our forests have given so much, inspiring me to create art that shares its incredible beauty. Journey with me now as we discover Hawaii's forests for life. The forests are landscapes into our lives, and those who walked their floors long before us knew in their na'au how their lives were vitally linked to the forest. Today, as our relationship changes with the forest and homes and developments creep ever higher into the mountains, we find people losing that deep connection the Hawaiians shared with this place and all its living creatures. Through my work, I am reminded daily of our cultural connection to the native forests. I help protect some of the rarest and smallest creatures that have lived on these islands for millions of years. Hawaii's first inhabitants. If we are not inspired to act, to do our part as stewards of Hawaii, many species could die out in the next few years, never to be seen again. Each loss, in its own way, severs yet another connection with our culture, with our lives, with our ancestors, who in their wisdom were inspired by what they saw, by what they heard, by what they experienced, and what the forests gave them. When you enter our forests, you're no longer in the realm of people. This is the realm of Akua, a realm that gives life. Forest is what produces our water and cleans our air, necessities that sustain all life in Hawaii. The forest is where our deities live, where our eldest kupuna live, all the different plants and animals that give inspiration to our lives and our identity as Hawaiians. You offer yourself when you enter forest and must be in the proper frame of mind there. You take a moment to pause, be still, and listen, and recognize that you've entered a realm that is sacred. The creatures of the Hawaiian forest are unlike those found anywhere else on earth. After our islands rose from the sea, it took millennia for them to be colonized. It is estimated that a new plant species was established every 100,000 years, after seeds braved ocean currents and strong winds, or hitched rides on visiting birds, they found new environments free of predators. Over time, many of them lost their defense mechanisms, which served to protect them from predatory creatures or safeguard them from foreign diseases that would try to do them in. The ancestors of our native species evolved in isolation into a dazzling array of new species, filling in the available space in their new home. Hawaiian culture is closely tied to these unique plants and animals. Unfortunately, when people introduce plants and animals from other places, it often set off a chain reaction that resulted in extinctions. Hawaii has the unfortunate title, the extinction capital of the world, with many more species currently endangered or at risk of extinction. <laughs> Ya ka ne ule honu a 
When native Hawaiians first arrived, the island's forests were teeming with tiny land snails, including the kahuli, or tree snails. Hawaii once hosted as many species of snails as the entire rest of the United States. Their brightly colored shells gave rise to the nickname, Jewels of the Forest. The Hawaiians celebrated kahuli in Oli, Mele, and Mo'olelo. They also believed kahuli possessed the ability to sing. Kahuli performed the role of decomposer, returning nutrients to the environment. When people first arrived here, they would have seen kahuli everywhere. You could turn over leaves and find them snuggling next to one another, often remaining on a single tree for their entire life. They are long-lived. If you first saw a kahuli as a child, it's possible you might continue to see that same kahuli into your 20s. How sad it is to think that most of these remaining species will be extinct in the wild in the next 5 to 10 years. It is quite possible our grandchildren may see a forest void of these creatures. When land snails start disappearing from a forest ecosystem, you know that, that something's out of balance, something's wrong. They're one of the first species that will drop out. Um, they're vulnerable to a lot of different factors. and. And so in that sense, we, we can use them to identify a healthy forest, and we can also use them to identify a forest that's experiencing um, detrimental impacts from invasive species or climate change. Despite the many challenges, there's always hope. Hawaii's conservationists work passionately to give kahuli and other endangered species a chance to survive. Projects focusing on individual species both great and small, were formed for this purpose, including the Snail Extinction Prevention Program. There's currently a captive breeding facility where snails from the wild can be brought in and kept safely until it's possible to return them to their native homes. Unfortunately, introduced predators, land change over time has all uh, contributed to the decline of, of this pretty spectacular fauna. We're currently on the, the brink of, of losing pro over 100 species within the next 10 years uh, at the rate of decline, and, and this is largely due to introduced predators. Often, extraordinary steps are taken to protect the species under our care. I personally was involved in what we called Operation Snail Bail when we moved hundreds of kahuli to safety during a hurricane. They are critically endangered, so we are kind of on high alert. Um, uh, yeah, so I will be spending the night with the snails <laughs> here in the office. Our islands, without tree snails, without the beauty of the Kamehameha butterfly, the siren call of the alala, or the delight of the nene, Hawaii state bird, would lose a core piece of their essence, their culture, their soul. Once on the brink of extinction, there were only 30 wild nene left on Hawaii Island by the early 1950s. They'd already been wiped out elsewhere across the islands. Persistence and keen focus on the goal of boosting their population has brought them close to 3,000 today. Uh, in this field, naturally, I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, you have to be. But um, I, I am optimistic. We, we have the tools to prevent the extinction. Nene provide a great example of how time, dedication, good science, and some luck make it possible to save a species on the brink. Nene are now well re-established on Maui and Kauai, and have recently been seen on Oahu for the first time in 300 years. The blueprint for saving the Nene has adapted and progressed. It's a guide being used in attempts to reintroduce and save other species like the native Hawaiian crow, the alala. Can you imagine never having seen a nene? We can't give up hope. There's so much at stake and still so much that can be accomplished to keep our forests, what they offer to both our natural and cultural worlds, vibrant and alive. We're faced with choices. Do we let native plants and animals slip away, victims of a voracious modern world? 
Or do we find the time, the energy, the money, and the emotional investment to return them to their rightful place in our collective consciousness? Return them to the forest for life. Healthy watersheds are essential to Hawaii's clear flowing streams and our vibrant nearshore coral reefs. Our forests for life create important connections between high mountain forests and lowland and coastal waters, so integral to Hawaiian life and the oft heard concept of Mauka to Makai. Our water that we drink today essentially came from 25 years ago where it fell from the sky through rain and percolated through our geological stratus. And um, by the time it gets to us, it's roughly about 25 years later. So it has had 25 years to filter through our geological um, uh, makeup from sand filtration, um, rocks, and so forth. This relationship maintains a beautiful balance, one that is key to the lovely environment more than a million people call home and tens of millions visit each year. This is a balance that is easily broken, but one that can be restored and maintained with the help of the watershed protectors. Molokai is an island of two tails, of two distinct sides. Along the Friendly Isles south slopes, you can clearly see the delicate relationship between Mauka forests and Makai coastal waters. These slopes were once covered by a unique shrubland and a forest found only on leeward sides of the islands. On Molokai's north shore, the world's highest sea cliffs frame mostly healthy forests, spared from goats that will devour everything in sight like they have done just a few miles away. This landscape for me has changed dramatically. Uh, I grew up in this part of Molokai, a little bit west of here and I hunted these areas from about 12 years old. And this is all, we always called this the moonscape because there was no vegetation. Lots of goats, thousands of goats. You can see just a few patches of green down in the gulches. You know, for years I've heard people say, we gotta do something about our eroding slopes. This barren land, stripped of its native vegetation, lies vulnerable to rain events where tons of dirt and silt flow freely downhill and onto the reefs. The South Sore Fringing Reef on Molokai, USGS has said that it's the longest continuous fringing reef, not just in Hawaii, but in the United States. And so what that means to me uh, in non-scientific terms is that that's one of Molokai's greatest food resources. That everybody goes on the reef to collect fish, octopus, or we call it he'e, um, shellfish like crab and lobster, um, limo. Limo is a seaweed that people use uh, for their food. Um, and just a whole variety of fish, fish species that people like to collect and eat. So it definitely is uh, our greatest food resource here at Molokai. I mean, I, I can see people wanting to protect their property, but the county should... The Watershed control. Partnership on Molokai and nine others on four other islands work to control erosion, fence critical watershed areas to keep out goats, pigs, cows, and deer, and revegetate the forests with native trees and shrubs. Fencing is a big piece of it. Uh, fencing off the invasive ungulates that can come in and do damage to the native vegetation. And then also reforestation and um, uh, replanting of native vegetation and a lot of weed management to get rid of the invasive species. It's been almost nine years since we started this goat control and I'm amazed at the vegetation recovery that's going on. Now it's not a moonscape anymore, it's green. There's, there's actually shrubs. There never used to be any shrubs on this let alone some of it are becoming trees. None of this existed at, at, um, when we, you know, growing up as a child and before 2009. You know, I fished all my life on this reef and uh, it, every winter, it used to always be 
red with sedimentation. Uh, today we we very rarely see that. Um, it's because the as you know vegetation holds the soil, the rivers flow cleaner, we get less sedimentation. The goat removal program has initiated real positive change. More native plants, less erosion, and less sediment to end up below on the fringing reef. First of all, the goats aren't being removed in their entirety. The goal of these management plans that each watershed partnership has and, and puts in place is to pick the areas that make the most sense for everybody to, to manage and to, to preserve and keep um, the ungulates, the goats, and the other ungulates out from. And those areas um, typically are inaccessible to most people anyway, and they are high up in the watershed, so they have the, um, they're preserving the highest recharge function to our water supply. The main thing is that they are not all being removed, just in select areas that make the most sense to conservationists, to hunters, to community members, really to all of us. So we're, we're um, really weighing a lot of different interests and, and, um, and values in order to, again, have, go for the common mission of protecting our water supply and preserving what's less left of our native forests. When watershed forests are protected and cared for in a Pono manner, native cloud catchers like the Ohi Alehua and the Majestic Koa help capture water that begins as a drip from their leaves down into the ground or into streams, and ultimately to the coast and the oceans. These trees capture and slow down deluges of rain with their rough, slow-growing bark. Their intricate roots help keep soil in place. No trees, and the soil has a pass to free flow downhill into the ocean. So the smaller ones here? Okay, yeah. One, yeah. So oh, yeah. Right about yeah, the yeah. smaller fish pond. Uh-huh. To that, um, to the stream bed. Mm -hmm. On Little Moloka'i, yeah. there's the start of something big. The marriage of modern science with knowledge of best practices passed down through generations from the original Hawaiian stewards expands beyond these shores. Building and learning, sharing knowledge across the islands. Another way is being forged to malama our forests for life. It is the right time, I would say. Sure, the right time would have been <laughs> decades ago, but we still have native forests that can be protected. We still have a healthy water supply that can be protected and enhanced. And so it's not too late. We're in O'Okala on Hawaii Island. The name of the property is Kamalu o Niupea. We're actually in Niupea Homesteads. On a misty morning, Kay Lundberg and her dog walk across her 40 acres. She is one of the superstars of private forest restoration, people who set up conservation easements. This means they've agreed to set aside land for conservation purposes forever. So my intent is to restore a native forest. Kay and other like-minded property owners can get expert help, technical assistance, and other resources from an array of federal and state agencies. She's received top awards from many of those agencies for her and her partner's work here at O'Okala. It's an ongoing process, but her forest looks a lot different today than before, when invasives, plants and animals that crowd out or destroy native plants, choked the native forest. The major invader here were pigs and strawberry guava. It was so thick, and, um, and then, then a lot of uh, guinea grass was here, so we weren't really able to even, I didn't even know what the property really looked like. All I knew is we had an amazing ohia, and I was advised, and I knew that if it wasn't managed properly, you know, they weren't going to survive. And now that we're dealing with rapid ohia death, the threat is even greater. So we're planting trees. That's what we're doing. We're planting trees and we're planting lots of ohias. So hopefully for the future. Invasive trees like strawberry guava are water suckers. In contrast,
native trees like ohia drip water onto the ground where slowly but surely one drop at a time underground aquifers get replenished invasives use almost every available drop to expand their own kingdom like an invading army of giants they swallow up virtually everything in their path making it difficult if not impossible for native plants and trees to thrive it's overwhelming um the maintenance of it because we have to constantly keep on it to keep the invasives i you know the strawberry guava we we have man we're managing it well but now we've got the tibochina uh very thick that we have to get rid of we have guinea grass that has come in now where the ground was disturbed so it's going to be an ongoing process so I'm very grateful for a conservation easement and I'm, you know, looking for the succession plan here, you know. This is a long-term project, you know, way beyond my lifetime. So I am very um, intent that it will stay in conservation and it will be very carefully transferred to the next steward. But this was probably this big when it went in the ground. And when we plant our trees, um, we, surround, we put cardboard around them. Kay feels that while the time and care needed to nurture lands under conservation easements is challenging, sometimes a mixed bag, she finds it extremely rewarding. But financing, equipment, resources, and most of all, passion, Kay says, are key. Our native species do not recognize land boundaries. Partnerships with landowners like Kay are essential for their persistence. It's a long-term reward, and I think the passion is the most important thing, the passion for the trees. In my case, it's native trees. So I know how few and far between they are now, and our native trees are fragile, and if they're not, if they're not restored, if they're not brought back onto the land, there will be no more native forests for our children and our grandchildren to see because the the ones that have been brought in the exotics and you know i have my own bias there but there i i, I want to protect the native trees restoration projects like case might soon get a boost through an innovative financing mechanism called carbon offsets <laughs> So, you are here. Traveling not too many miles from the eastern slopes of Mauna Kea to the north, this group is visiting the Pu'umali restoration area. This was once a prime forest of native koa and is home to one of the most endangered Hawaiian birds, the palila. In the decades that followed, cattle ranching and a forest fire left the area unrecognizable. Now, Pu'umali aims to meet the challenge of combating climate change. This groundbreaking project will harness the power of public-private partnerships to replace entire forests and offset the very thing that causes climate change. The carbon produced when we drive our cars, cool our homes, or fly on an airplane. We invite private entities to partner with the state in um, reforesting this area restoring palila habitat, prime uh, native forest, and um, combine it with a carbon forest product, a project. So we want to have uh, this, the reforestation certified by an established uh, carbon standard. That, that's basically a third party that uh, certifies that you are uh, storing a certain amount of carbon by reforesting um, the area. So whenever we plant a, co a koa tree so just like that, um, with the photosynthesis it sucks out carbon dioxide, one of the major uh, greenhouse gases that is changing our climate as we speak, and it stores it in, in biomass. Restoring forests this way provides untold additional benefits. Let's say an airline wants to offset their carbon emissions. For now, they cannot fly without fossil fuels. So they have to look at ways, okay, this 
all these emissions that we put into the atmosphere, uh, how can we mitigate that? And a project like this would be the perfect opportunity because it has so many benefits. Not only is it storing the carbon um, and sucking it out of the atmosphere, but it also creates critical habitat. Just like Kay Lundberg's efforts around the mountain, just on a much larger scale, returning large landscapes to the way they used to be has countless challenges. You're at the mercy of the weather. Too much rain, too much sun, too hot. And that tenacious battle of keeping out non-native and invasive plants and animals bent on reversing any progress. Hawaii is on the forefront of this movement, which recognizes there are many things we can each do to keep our water fresh, clean, and abundant. To behave Pono by recognizing how land, water, mountain, and ocean are all connected. If we protect our forests for life, they will assuredly help sustain our lives. It is very exciting and um, we are definitely taking a lead and we are proud to continue this tradition of Hawaii to, to be a national leader when it comes to uh, environmental protection and to conserva conservation. Um, and these innovative approaches such as the, the forest carbon mechanism. Before people, there were no fires. Even flowing lava and lightning strikes were unlikely to spark fire in the dense native shrubs and wet forests. As people altered the landscape and introduced foreign plants and animals, the natural structure of the forest broke down. Tinder grasses invaded and crept higher into the mountain, like fuses waiting to ignite. But what tends to happen is when the fire goes through, it consumes all the native plants in a particular watershed that we manage. And because it's not a fire adapted community, plant community, ecologically, um, it doesn't tend to recover well. So what tends to happen is after this fire goes through, it burns and removes a lot of the native ground cover. And the first thing that grows back is the one that outcompetes everything else, is the non-natives. The most fire resilient forests are the native ones. Forests invaded by non-native species or afflicted with the slow burn of diseases like rapid ohia death are more susceptible to burning faster and hotter. As a percentage of land area, the Aloha state typically loses as much forest to fire every year as most western states. And it's not really a season we have, but we've had fires in January, we've had fires in June, we've had fires in November, December. So for us, it's, we just have to be ready at, any, at all times. These places that you see that are green, in a matter of a month and a month and a half, it could easily become brown. Uh, you know, it depends on the weather, what's proceeding, if it's been a windy period or if it's just lack of rain. Um, from your side? It's kind of funky, so, yeah. These are the first responders for wildfires on millions of acres of state land. I know. They also support the firefights on county and federally owned lands. That, combined with the states, accounts for 60% of all of Hawaii. But most of the time, between us and the county, we have it worked out pretty well where they'll take care of the life in the property and if we have an area up in the mountain where it's a watershed we have to protect, then we go directly to the watershed. This means having fire trucks, tools, equipment, and firefighters ready to go is essential to protect vast areas. These trucks are solely dedicated just to wildland fire. The pumps are already on it. Whatever necessary we need for fires is we load it on these trucks already. So these people, so our staff, when they get called in, they're just literally coming in, grab their PPE, grab their gear, and then going straight into these trucks, and then we're heading out to the fire. With few dedicated firefighters, Ordinary staff are trained and ready to leave their desks at a moment's notice. This work can eat up millions of dollars each year and could continue to increase as the climate changes. Dry areas are predicted to get drier, fires expected to be hotter and last longer. When they reach into the watershed areas and our native forests, 
the consequences can be devastating. Remember how native trees are efficient in transporting water from rain into the ground and aquifers? Unfortunately for us here in Maui, every time we have a fire, somehow we always have a huge rain event that follows. And it usually, you know, there's no interception, precipitation or raindrop um, interception. So when these raindrops hit and when they come, they're coming heavy. So now when it hits the ground, no ground cover, that soil goes down into a stream or starts to begin to run off. And that's when you see it end up in the ocean. Once again, the Mauka to Makai connection. Erosion and runoff into coastal waters are just a couple of the negative impacts of fire. When fire gets into the native forest, we lose its great water capturing ability. The clear, clean, naturally filtered water we enjoy from our faucets is ultimately reduced. This is why trying to replant forests quickly and with the right kind of plants is vitally important. Managing our native forests well and aggressive firefighting in all our watersheds is important to the very survival of some really rare plants. A fire here in 2016 scorched two and a half thousand acres and burned into the Nanakuli Forest Reserve. While the flames were still dying, Marigold Zoll and Susan Ching hiked across freshly charred ground and up into the forest to check on a single tree. It's the last <laughs> remaining wild nau, or Hawaiian gardenia, on Oahu. I think most of it is dead, maybe from the heat. Right on the edge of where trees were burning just a few days ago, Susan climbs barefooted into the gardenia tree to collect fruit. Such is the passion of virtually everyone you meet who works to protect Hawaii's forests for life. Now this fruit's been hanging on the tree for a while, so oh, let's man. see how she looks. It, oh, look, it's charred on one side. Wow. Yeah, it really did get burned. It's just escaped. Oh my gosh, it's burnt. There are only 16 of these trees left anywhere on Earth. This one on Oahu, and the other 15 on Lanai. Another example of how precariously close many native plants and animals are to being wiped from the face of the earth forever. And reason for Susan's delight. That's amazing with the charred fruit and everything and there's still some seeds in there. Oh wow, she was really spared. She just barely made it. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's like a... It's really special that 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 um, the fire burned all around this whole fence, and it's a tiny fence, and and um, she got some char on the fruit and char on the leaves, but but she's still here. So I'm happy, I'm sad at the same time. So, but overall, I feel good. I feel like our efforts made a difference. It's not as much as I'd like, but but we all have been working hard you know, in this area and dry forest in general. So it's hard to make a huge difference. But they do make a difference. Just as every step each of us takes to learn how our lives intersect and intertwine with the forests that rise above us in Hawaii's celebrated mountains, the backdrop and backbone of these islands, we can't afford to take them for granted. In April 2018, the skies over Kauai opened up and over certain places, more rain fell in 24 hours than has ever been recorded anywhere. This epic flood toppled homes from their foundations, overturned two-ton trucks, swept countless tons of debris out to sea, and for many months cut off permanent road access for hundreds of people on Kauai's north shore. Powerful raging waters cut into mountainsides and left enormous erosion scars. It was dramatic. We'll never know exactly how much rain actually fell in this location since we didn't have an automated rain gauge. Uh, I measured accurately 30 inches of rain um, in 12 hours in, in 1987. 
And my guess is we had more than twice that. Uh, we know Hanalei recorded 50 inches. We're in uh, Limuhuli Valley. In, in the particular, we're in the lower Limuhuli Preserve, which is a natural area. And among the most beautiful, pristine, and biologically diverse places anywhere in the Hawaiian archipelago, Chipper Wickman of the National Tropical Botanical Gardens, of which Limahuli is a part of, and Melissa Fisher from the Nature Conservancy are eager to point out that it was the actions taken before the big flood that really saved the upper portion of the thousand acre valley and its rare plants and birds. We are kind of split geographically into the lower preserve and the upper preserve. We've got an 800 foot high waterfall that separates the two. The upper preserve is entirely fenced with ungulate uh, fence. Um, and we manage that area very, very actively for ground nesting seabirds. There he is. Go find petrol chick. As well as for the uh, by the rest of the biodiversity in that area, but it's the only known nesting site on this island for the Hawaiian petrel. Um, we've recently tr translocated some to Kilauea Point, which has been very, very successful, so we're thrilled with that. Uh, but that area is virtually pristine. It never was degraded uh, by cattle or human, human impact. And with the ungulate fence and, and, pre and ungulate free, it's a, it's a really intact a native system up there. Um, and it was really amazing. Now, now, part of what I'm going to describe could be partially due to greater intensity of rain in the lower preserve because it was a very localized rain event. Uh, but we had no landslides in the upper preserve. We had no damage to our fence. Uh, the, the biodiversity uh, up there really didn't have any long-term or significant co uh, negative consequences. Uh, the, the stream obviously was raging and everything was running off, but uh, intact native system is is uh, not monotypic, it's diverse, it's designed to be able to catch and filter uh, rainfall. And so we really saw that system up there functioning really well. As Chipper was mentioning, the more complex the forest, the more diverse the forest, the better it is to capture that fresh water, the easier it's gonna be to slowly filter it down to the forest floor. Whereas you look at a more simple forest where you might have albizia or strawberry guava who these types of forests create just stands of trees that crowd out all the native species, but they act as almost funnels and the water just runs down their smooth bark to the forest floor and causes erosion and runoff, which then affects our streams and rivers and, and floats down to the reefs. And so it, it affects the whole system. Yet another Malka to Makai example to show you how everything that happens up high has a definite impact down low. It's really a classic cause and effect. On Kauai, the Nature Conservancy helps coordinate one of the watershed partnerships. The Kauai Watershed Alliance includes 11 landowners and the county's water department. These lands come together at the top of the mountain the headwaters for all seven major rivers on the Garden Island. In Melissa's words, and as you can see for yourself, this is a pretty amazing place. Now we've learned that Hawaii's native forests can dampen the impact of natural disasters. Our list of benefits just keeps growing. A cultural resource, home to rare native plants and animals, great for keeping erosion at bay, and out of the bays. Wonderful for storing carbon and countering the pollutants we put into the air. More fire resistant than unhealthy or non-native forests. And as Kauai learned in 2018, helpful in controlling flooding and reducing the damage it causes. Most importantly, bringing us back to the one thing that we all appreciate, these forests for life protect the clean water we drink. We live on an island, we're in the middle of nowhere, and if we can't take care of our own fresh water, it won't be there for future generations. How much water do we have? How does it get from the ground to our faucets? And what's happening to make sure a steady flow continues? This is East Maui where forests and water are so closely linked 
that water seems to run, flow, and move just about everywhere. We're in Hanavi, uh, above the Ko'olau Ditch, as part of the East Maui Irrigation System in uh, East Maui. East Maui is part of windward uh, Haleakala, and the trade winds bring a lot of rainfall to Haleakala, and this rainfall contributes to groundwater recharge and surface flow. Protecting the watershed, uh, specifically the forests within the watershed, is an important component to the water cycle. Uh, the forests act as the sponge that captures all that rainfall that the trade winds bring. And that sponge releases it both in terms of groundwater recharge and surface flow. Some of this surface water gets diverted to the central plains for drinking water supply and agriculture. For a very long time, much of Maui's water was used to grow crops, like sugarcane. Now that large-scale farming has mostly stopped, state regulators are taking a hard look at reallocating water from streams, surface water, to other beneficial uses. So we evaluate freshwater habitat, recreational and aesthetic values, traditional and customary practices, water quality, uh, and a variety of in-stream uses that are defined by the state water code. It doesn't hurt to repeat what we've heard over and over. Philosophy and a way of thinking formed more than a century ago. It was stated about a hundred years ago that water was our number one resource that our forests provided. It wasn't timber, it wasn't land, it was the water. And uh, it's evident that without water, life wouldn't survive uh, here in the islands. So protecting our watersheds, protecting our resources, but all, all, also utilizing them to the best uh, extent possible uh, while striking a balance, maintaining in-stream values uh, is going to be important moving forward as the climate is changing, as rainfall patterns change, as drought becomes a bigger issue. Um, our water supply and the consistency and reliability is going to be an important component to our community. The importance of water in forests was firmly established after vast tracts of lowland trees began disappearing in the early 1900s. They were victims of tree harvesting and cattle grazing. Streams ran dry. Farmers noticed the decline. So did the foresters of the time, whose early work aimed to bring watershed forests back. They searched the world for plants and trees to mimic the original forest, with the thinking the native trees would not come back and unfortunately leading to the introductions of alien species. On the bright side, the planting of 12 and a half million of these mostly non-native trees in the early 1940s heralded the concept of forest protection and restoration. The rain following the forest, which is as valid today as ever. From the sky, to the forest, to the ground, to the underground, and back up again. We produce about 36 million gallons a day. Most of that is groundwater. Um, here where we are in, in Iao, in central Maui, about 90% of that water is from groundwater and some is from surface water, as like Bailuka River behind us. Um, other areas like uh, Lahaina, the west side and upcountry, we rely heavily on, on surface water. Um, then we, on Molokai, it's 100% reliant on, on, on groundwater. Ava Blumenstein is with the county department that gets water from the ground or surface to the majority of Maui's homes, schools and businesses. We literally walk on our water supply. So anything that you dump or that you, uh, spills on the ground can leach through the soil and into the aquifer and contaminate it. And knowing just how important its forests are for life, the county government on Maui has invested millions of dollars to protect water supplies. That includes fencing to keep hungry critters out of sensitive forest watershed areas. It includes pipes and tanks to move water and store it. They even support research on invasive plants and how to control them and knock them down. And it has replaced the native forest. We know that uh, we're getting less recharge because that's the real water hog. That particular tree uh, uses more water than native species and it's not as good as uh, intact native habit or uh, uh, ecosystem really to capture all that rainfall. 
Kapoa and Ohia, and then we have like the smaller trees like Aali'i. With all the forest protection and replanting projects happening all across the state, there's a real sense of optimism. And shortly, you'll meet some of the people who have their boots on the ground, working and volunteering to be sure that optimism is true and lasting. There, there is plentiful and there's pristine water resources here. In terms of groundwater, we have 426 million gallons a day. We certainly have the supply there. It's just a way of managing and using it uh, responsibly. What can you do to help our forests for life and the water we drink? Really, it's just a matter of awareness and perhaps changing your habits or behavior a touch. For now, Hawaii's fresh water supplies are secure, but it may not always be that way. We often have droughts which can seriously tax how much water is available. Beyond not wasting water today or tomorrow, it's about remembering that what we do on land affects the ocean. What we do up high in the mountains, across our agricultural plains, and even in our own backyards, impacts everything down below. You guys ready to go over a couple plants? Maybe a little safety briefing? Take a look this at that, is something you'll more and more people are learning and embracing. Which makes it really easy to identify, but it also has a lot of these like really nasty little pokies on here. So I'm going to pass this one around. We are located right now in the Pohole Natural Area Reserve uh, at a site we like to call the Makua Rim or the Overlook site. And so today we have a group of volunteers helping us weed out one of our restoration sites. Uh, if you look around, we've got lots of native and non-native plants, and so they are an essential part of our workforce in trying to uh, maintain watershed quality as well as maintain biodiversity of our native forests. Almost every single day, you can find staff and volunteers out working in the forest. They spray weeds and yank invasive plants out of the ground. They plant native ones. They learn the ways of the woods. Our volunteers are really crucial for our program. We have so much areas and we have a limited amount of staff being the state. And so uh, as we start to grow and as we start to really get into our priority areas and even areas around that, we find it really useful to have all this volunteer labor. Their motivations for helping native forests recover and thrive vary. Some folks hike or hunt and want to be sure they can continue having fun in Hawaii's unique and beautiful native forests. Sometimes people volunteer for a day or two. Others sign up for five or six or seven days, working in remote places. Many others make volunteering in the forest a constant in their lives. They all get something different from the experience. Oh my gosh, your body calms down, you become peaceful, you become happy. I like to do it because it's beautiful. The Hawaiian forest is beautiful. Beyond individual volunteers, there are countless community groups and companies, like Coca-Cola, that donate time, money, and labor to give native forests a helping hand. In one of Oahu's most important and productive watersheds, Coca-Cola helps build fences. The fencing projects that the state undertakes are usually pretty expensive, so we rely on partners that include state money from the state legislature. We have some Board of Water Supply money dedicated to this project, as well as funding from Coca-Cola Company. Um, that being said, we still have quite a bit more that we need to raise in order to complete the fence. Even the Army gets into the act. The funds are very limited, and so they provided about $200,000 worth of airlift capacity and so it really makes our dollars stretch a lot further when we're able to partner with them. They're saving us a significant amount of money by doing this as a training opportunity for the National Guard so it's a win-win for both sides. One of the best places to see this spirit of cooperation for the good of a native forest is on the steep and sweeping leeward slopes of Mount Haleakala on Maui. For many decades, goats and cows did their best to level everything. Cooperation between the state, the Maui Forest Bird Recovery Project, and volunteers are making a real difference. All right, um, 
90. Okay. So that's 290. Mm -hmm. Oh, here? While the work here is already paying dividends by reducing erosion and runoff, and by reintroducing native trees like koa and ohia, it has a very specific purpose. We are trying to reestablish enough forest to bring the native forest birds back to this spot. So the success of this site has actually really um, blown us away. Uh, this, the fence and the fence went up, and the ungulates were out of here in around 2012. The final animals out, and at that time we started experimental plant plantings as well as monitoring natural regeneration that was going on in here. And the survival rates of the outplantings in this area surpassed any of our expectations. Um, we've also found techniques to be able to enhance natural regeneration and the forest is coming back a lot faster than we anticipated. More than a quarter of a million native trees are now in the ground here, planted by staff and many, many volunteers. Soon, it's hoped this forest will once again be full of the songs of native birds, which will be music to the ears of the many, many people who've helped it along. This is something that I always tell our crew and people who come up here, and whether they're volunteering or they're getting paid to come up here as our, as our employees, but I tell people, I said, you know, although you're getting paid to do your job, I said, it takes a different person that's got to love what they do to come up here and, you know, high winds, lots of rain, but they do it. And this is the product, you know, fruits of their labor. And I'm really happy to see this today. On a country road in the back of the valley in Waimanalo, the sound of a sawmill breaks the still morning air. Here at Waimanalo Wood, Miles Ludke and his business partner Elmer have a thriving business milling all kinds of wood into usable lumber that can build our homes. They even make use harmful, invasive trees like albizia that desperately need to be taken out of the forest. You know, we've had projects milling albizia wood, Norfolk pine, um, a lot of the more currently popular stuff, monkey pod, mango, milo, kamani, ko. Um, we got some false kamani, we got eucalyptus robusta, the list goes on and on. On another country road, Near the Hamakua coast on Hawaii Island, Timothy Shafto turns a bull. We, we have some of the, the best woods here in Hawaii, and this is one way to showcase the beautiful woods that we have in Hawaii, and it's a very sustainable forest. He's one of a growing number of wood magicians using milled wood from fallen trees to create beautiful and functional works of art. And on a busy urban street on the University of Hawaii campus in Manoa, another work of art takes up an entire street corner. Again, the focus is to remove albizia from the forest and turn it into something good. So this is an albizia prototype. Um, it's a temporary demonstration here at the university. It was my dissertation work at the School of Architecture, uh, my research, and that was then funded after I graduated and we have built it over the last two years. Essentially it's demonstrating the use of alb invasive albizia as a viable building material. The sawmill, the bull turning, and the tiny house are all examples of the ways Hawaii is using wood resources in innovative and sustainable ways. Joey Valenti, the man who designed and built the tiny house at UH, leads the Hawaii Wood Utilization Team. Formed in 2017, it's a group of experts from various wood-related industries aiming to produce and initiate innovative cross-sector ideas and projects that expand wood product markets in Hawaii. This project behind me and what we're looking at next, um, I think it's sparking something that, that was there but just hasn't really been, um, hasn't really been explored at the right time, and I think we're, we're at that time now. Hawaii has never had much of a timber industry, mostly because it costs so much 
to ship wood to the continent or overseas. But with a plethora of exotic and beautiful native woods, along with invasive trees like Albizia that need removing, there's a movement to develop local markets and uses for Hawaii's forest products that can sustain our lives in these islands. We work with a eco-friendly casket company named Pahiki Caskets and they use a lot of our Norfolk and they're using the Albizia too and some monkey pod. Um, really people come here and and get wood for any reason that wood is traditionally used for shelving, countertops, a box, anything. Hopefully one day, harmful trees like Albizia will no longer be available from our forests, and our local woodworkers will only have native and non-invasive species to work with. On Hawaii Island, Tim has expanded his talents and his repertoire from beautiful koa kamani and milo bowls to art pieces that use other materials but focus on wood. This one here is just an abstract which all, all these pieces, what I'm trying to do is uh, showcase the wood. Uh, one, and one thing that I don't do is I don't work with uh, trees that have been taken down live. It's all dead, fallen, and dying trees. Uh, so again, this, all these here started with the platter, with the, the resin. And so here we have the koa and I have the colored resin. And I build my own panels. Uh, so it's all start to finish. Um, this one over here, this is uh, my landscapes. So we have the koa here and the sand here, which I can say I don't take from the beach. Um, so you got the wood, you got the sand, and you got the resin right here. Wow, that's really beautiful. My art is not created from wood, but it's inspired by our native forests. And I hope that you've been inspired to join all the people we've met in caring for and protecting our forests for life. In so many ways, forests truly are the life force of our islands. Vital for us today and into the future, forever. I'm Kupa'ahi. Mahalo for accompanying me on this journey and ahui ho. <laughs>